Um, so yeah, it's a couple of minutes after three. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, uh, today uh, I have the uh, the honor, and I'm pleased to have Stefan Lukosch here, uh, uh, who gives today's lecture on engaging human augmentation. So he just said uh, that he slightly changed uh, uh, this title, but it's still uh, very interesting. Um, Stefan moved recently, I know it was last year in September, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to New Zealand. So I have the pleasure to work with him and to meet him quite often. So I know a bit what he's doing, but I'm looking forward to his presentation. So Stefan, over to you and I mute myself. All right. Thank you Tobias for the nice introduction. Um, I think, well, almost everything is set. Uh, by this. Um, indeed, I moved to New Zealand last year, joined the HitLab. Before then, I was in the Netherlands at the Delft University of Technology. And um, I think most of the things I'm talking about today will still be results from my work back in Delft, because things here are starting up and starting up a bit slowly. Um, but it's due to, well, external forces that we cannot really control. Um, Today's lecture, I'm really happy to be part of this lecture series, is about engaging human augmentation. And, okay, uh, and I would like basically starting the lecture by explaining where I come from or where my interest in human augmentation and engagement comes from. So artificial intelligence, not really my, let's say, speciality, but is something that over the last years really was in the news pretty largely because AI systems I need to move that, um, basically beat world champion in games like chess, Jeopardy or, or Go. The last one Go was really somebody never ever has never believed in that that would be possible. AI systems are also very important in financial trading, diagnosis, recommendations and so on. But one thing AI systems still miss are experience our creativity and leadership. And um, as a result, the humans, us, we are still leading in innovation or design. Still, that might change, but for now, well, we are leading in that domain. So if you now take artificial intelligence, I don't know why this is not, ah, and would combine artificial intelligence with humans, um, you might get something like um, Iron Man, Jarvis, just another really, uh, very intelligent system. Um, I think most of you have seen the film, so I won't explain that too much. Um, but artificial intelligence in these movies helps Iron Man and gives him a more or better perception of the environment. So by combi combining AI and humans, you, the yeah. human-centered intelligent systems are created. You can create intelligent user interfaces and typical examples for that would be effective systems, empathic systems. Um, what they in, in the end do, relying on artificial intelligence, they amplify exist, existing or create new human skills and capabilities. Um, one of my favorite examples, next to Iron Man, um, and normally if I would be in class, I would ask you to raise your hands who's old enough to still know the six million dollar man. But that was the series, TV series, ABC TV series that I was watching in my youth, and I was always, oh, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> and I really enjoyed watching. Um, and the $6 million man, he was also like augmented with technology. And this technology helped him to, well, in this case, fight crime, fight spies, solve very, very difficult problems that normally you couldn't do. So the $6 million man is already moving away from the intelligent system or human centered intelligent system to. Okay, I think we lost Stefan. Still in there. I'm back. I'm back, okay. Uh, the screen is not shared, right? Yeah, somehow your, your connection was really dropping before that. Uh, you Ooh. were hanging a bit. Uh, you're still relatively lo-fi, uh, but I would say maybe your, your audio was still okay. Maybe you just continue from where you, where you stopped and we just hope that it was that 
random hiccup. But your connection uh, is really not that great. That's interesting. Uh, let me see, is there something running in the background that I'm not aware of? Not really. Network seems to be fine. Hmm. Uh, so, are you seeing my slides again? Uh, yeah, but presenter mode? Uh, you need a hardwire? I, I have a hardwire. I don't know why. It's, okay. No idea. Thank you, Rob. Um, how about now? Um, Do you see presenter mode or? Checking if I have here. I'm seeing uh, presenter mode. Yes. You see? Okay. That's weird. That's for me. The presenter mode is on the other side, but okay. Um, I think I was here, right? Uh, probably the slide before, but uh, sorry. What okay. is, wait, I'm just briefly checking. Was disconnected from Zoom two at you? Okay, a couple of people were. Con oh, perhaps I'm. Uh, perhaps we are hacked. We are so secret. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have the. I'm. I'm more worried that it's something else. Uh, Okay, we, 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 we give it a try. I actually have more worry that it's all done. We, we, we just continue and, and we see how it goes. Yeah, let's see what happens. So the last thing I said here was basically the $6 million man already moves away a bit from human-centered intelligence systems, a bit towards uh, human augmentation. Still, I like this example a lot. But to reiterate the integration of AI and humans, that basically goes back to an... Um, article or that um, Douglas Engelbart wrote in 1962 about augmenting human intellect and the, in there he coined the term augmented intelligence. And what he basically said that if a computer system um, would, does, would do nothing more than execute or increase the performance of human interacting with artifacts that would give the humans a way, way more capacity to um, yeah, well, to gain comprehension and derive solutions, they would not have to focus on using the artifact, but would be supported in the use of the artifact. So basically, giving, using AI to give humans spare capacity to deal with real world problems, complex situations. Um, from augmented intelligence, so I started with AI, um, talked about um, AI and humans, augmented intelligence. I come to augmented humans or human augmentation. And um, this for me means basically going a bit back to uh, the $6 million man, but still use artificial intelligence to provide and support uh, humans in their tasks. So just want to say I do not want to limit human augmentation to intellectual abilities, but basically shift from the human computer interaction to human computer integration. And this is also how Ricky Moto defined the augmented human in 2013. So trying to augment human abilities by human computer integration, creating new and enhanced existing experiences, offering new skills, offering new capabilities to humans. And as the title suggested of this presentation, I very much look into how to engage users with systems and how to keep up their engagement doing things. Um, there's a huge interest into physical activities, as the pictures on this slide suggest, but there's also interest in applying human augmentation in more professional settings, like in health settings or in safety, secure, safety and security, where it is also very important that the users of the systems believe in the system and are engaged with the system. And engagement is a very broad term, and um, just for the sake of this presentation, because I delighted to have uh, to the ability to still work with a PhD student uh, back in Delft on engagement. And we look into a new, creating a new model for user engagement, which will be based on this one, but goes a bit beyond this. Um, this model from O'Brien and Toms um, on engagement basically says you engage with whatever kind of system. And at a certain point of time, there's a point of engagement. Then you work with the system for a certain point, a period of time, and then there's an, um, disengagement point in time. 
But during all these phases, there are certain attributes that contribute to your engagement. Like, for example, if you think about playing a game, the novelty of a game, the aesthetics of the game might be most important for you to start working or playing with the game. During your game play, then, for example, um, your ability to interact with the game might be really important. The way that you are challenged might be really important to keep you engaged. But at some point of time, once you have played with the game and possibly you're not managing to reach the final stages of the game, um, there will be a lot of negative effect, which is again an attribute in this model, and that will make you stop playing the game. And what I try within all the projects that I'm going to present in the remaining time of this presentation is, to check on these different attributes and to understand what makes or keeps up the engagement or let's uh, prevents users from being engaged with a system for human augmentation. Okay, and I have basically three domains I want to talk about. Talk about one is health, one is safety and security, and one is um, sports. So back in Delft, at some point of time, we had a project with the Leiden University Medical um, Clinic, with the Department of Neurology, and um, we got in contact with them because they wanted to look into new valid and efficient tools to assess upper extremity motor dysfunctions with um, Alzheimer, Parkinson, and uh, stroke patients. And um, obviously, there are clinical methods, validated clinical methods, but what we learned is that they are considered as boring, Patients are not really engaged. They feel stressed. They feel in a examin yeah. They feel stressed because of the examination. And very often, it's basically up to the clinician to judge and write down marks on how well a patient is doing or not. So our idea was to work together with the patients, design games to relieve them from the stress. And while they are playing these games, um, we would use sensor technology to record their movement and to come up with an objective assessment. Um, we then thought about augmented reality games because augmented reality games can easily, while the patients play, be adapted to the skills of the patient. So you can move objects further away, make them smaller or bigger and all these kind of things. We also decided for AR versus VR because in augmented reality, there's still a connection of the patients to the real world Whereas in the virtual world, they are completely in an artificial environment. And um, the idea behind it was like that they would show more natural behavior being in the real world rather than being in a completely artificial world. So we worked with patients. Um, we had uh, several students working on this project and uh, postdocs as well. And uh, we designed a series of games that we then tested with the patients. and. Um, then checked on how well the patients perceived them, how well um, the usability was and how well um, they were engaged with the game. And then the next slide, hopefully the movies work, shows, should show some ideas. And hopefully the sound is off so that Tobias doesn't get any YouTube problems because they don't know where the sound comes from. But you can see here one of the first prototypes that was a patient testing the system. That's uh, the student who developed it in the end. But what we actually did, we designed a game, very simple game called Post Office Trouble. And the idea was that somebody messed up with the parcels in a post office and that the patient had to basically uh, grab the blocks in front of him or her. And then they could see a picture like this one, for example. And then they had to move it to a destination country that they were recognizing based on this. So there was some kind of dual task load. At the later stage, um, we created a new set of games um, where we used a different kind of headset, where we used different modes of hand tracking, where we used a different AR technology, um, where we increased the interaction space and gave feedback to patients on um, when they were grabbing a block or not, um, and ran further studies. We also tried out um, some more tangible interfaces. So in this one, this game is called Candy Factory, where you basically the moment you were wearing the head-mounted display, you were seeing a basket in front of you, and then there were conveyor belts with candies, and you had to move the basket towards the conveyor belts to collect the candy. And then you got some audio feedback, but also some haptic feedback. So we were 
checking on whether the haptic feedback and the, the way of interacting with a controller would actually improve the engagement of the patients. And uh, we also had a game that was using, so the previous games, they were all on basically moving around in space and um, showing how well you can move your arms. So what is your reaching space? Uh, with the parcels, it was about the opening of your pinch. This game was focusing very much on the pinch as well, but there was also a tapping motion and uh, the clinicians wanted to know about the frequency. So here you could basically color a ball and then someone sometime later in the game, you could basically use your ball and, oh, it's not in the movie. I'm sorry for that. Well, you could color the ball and then shoot the ball and then it was ex the ball was exploding and there was a water fountain and these kind of things. Um, based on these, I would say, pre-studies, we in the end developed in a set of mini games um, in the first part of the game, where you now can only see a black screen. But the idea was here to calibrate the system towards their capabilities and you had to reach out to the balloons and make the balloons explode. And once we knew approximately the reaching space of the patients, um, they could play further games. So you see here a patient that's playing the game. But that was again based on different um, block sizes and the scaffold. And then patients had to grab the blocks and put them into the scaffold. And every now and then, every time they put and place a block correctly, um, a part of a very well-known Dutch melody was played and was encouraging patients basically to complete the scaffold to hear the complete melody at the end. And this one was about pinching and reaching space. And the third game, that is this one, that was again about grabbing and pinching an object, in this case, a walnut. And move the walnut in the basket. And every now and then, while you were playing, then a squirrel showed up. And then you had to basically, while you were moving the walnut, you had to go around the squirrel. And hereby, we wanted to test how well patients could adapt their movement or their target directed movement. So, as I said before, we looked into attributes that can foster engagement or keep up engagement. So, um, one of the things that we looked at is the usability. So for this, we use the system usability scale. And that I'm referring to that. I'm not going to really explain in detail how it works. Most of you will know that anyway. But uh, to give you a reference on what kind of methods we use to check upon the attributes. So we use the system usability scale on uh, usability. And we use the game experience questionnaire to check on how well patients, um, yeah, how how they perceived the gameplay on whether they were feeling competent, immersed, whether they came into a situation of flow, um, whether there was a tension, a feeling tension or were challenged enough. Um, this questionnaire has been discussed lately a lot. Uh, it's still one of the most cited and used questionnaires for evaluating game experience. It consists of three modules, core questionnaire, social presence module and post game module. We only use the post game module. Um, we had really, really good experiences with it, um, but um, everyone within, well, listening to this talk should check also on the article by Effie Law, Hulman and Meckler on the review of the game experience questionnaire because there are some um, issues that you should think about before applying it. Still, so I think it's... Uh, just yeah. really quickly, uh, um, we are still, uh, at least here in Dunedin, we still see the video player. Uh, really? Yes. Uh, now we see the slides. Sorry, continue. That's that's a huge delay. So which slide do you see now? Now we see the game experience questionnaire. Uh, okay. The I think the video was a bit bit, bit hanging. Yeah, even though now your sound is perfect, just continue. It's I, I think it's okay, and we will put the slides online anyways. Yeah, we'll do. So. Um, I think the important point here, it's worthwhile exploring this questionnaire. Just be aware that there are some issues on the validation and check the article from 2018, which reference is given at, at the lower part of the slides. 
but checking on usability, checking on game experience, doing interviews with the patients, doing also measurements on how well they are moving. Um, what we actually learned from this project um, is that AR games have potential for assessing motor impairments. Um, the sensor technology that we used that was basically just camera technology um, is not precise enough to really outperform a well-trained clinician. So there are some issues. Um, still, the combination of AR and games really engaged patients to show their best possible motor skills. And that was really interesting for the clinicians as well as for us, because it showed that this form of human augmentation um, can be very well applied in um, medical settings as well. Um, okay, I will keep it with that for the moment because I think I'm running out of time. Already know that now. Um, another domain in which we applied safety and security back in Delft is in, uh, in which we applied human augmentation as safety and security. And that was mainly with the Dutch police. There was a series of projects uh, that we did, one on crimes investigation, one on more distributed situational awareness, which I would like to talk about now. And another one that was more about um, helping police agents out in the field and recognizing certain points or locations on yeah, where they need to do perform certain actions. So more location-based um, support. In this project here, that was called yeah, on the I'm, spot. I'm really sorry to disturb you again, and I'm not sure why this is, but it's again, we are stuck on the slide. I'm not sure what you did magically last time. Nothing. Really, I have no idea to be as, I am happy that you say it because I, I don't know <laughs> that this happens. For me, everything works smoothly. So I'm connected, um, I can see everything. You're very smooth and suddenly you're also on the next slide. I'm not sure. Which slide do you see now? It should uh, show. The one where you're on the right hand side, uh, human augmentation for distributed signal awareness. Yeah. But it just That's came. One. But it just came in. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why it's always a bit behind. I'm really sorry. I don't want to disturb you. <laughs> um, could it be that I, because I share not my desktop, but the application, should I share the desktop and see? Seth, might that make things easier? What do you normally do? That's what I normally do. Um, okay. Maybe that's, that's a thing. Let's give it a try. Um, let's see. Uh, how about this? Do I need to swap displays again, or? Yeah, now you need to swap uh, to the to the presenter mode. Yeah. How about this? Uh, that's perfect. We will see how it goes. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will. I'm, I'm I'm really sorry. <laughs> no worries. Interesting movie for YouTube later. Anyway. Um, okay. So this project on the spot. Um, the idea here was to use augmented reality to provide police officers or firemen or crime scene investigators at a scene um, with additional information in augmented reality, as well as with support by a remote investigator, remote policeman or remote fireman. So persons arriving at a crime scene were wearing a head mounted display and in this, via this head mounted display, a remote person could see what they were seeing and jointly they could augment the crime scene and the remote person could provide additional information on the crime scene. What we wanted to explore in this project is whether this form of augmentation increases the situational awareness of the policeman wearing the head-mounted display at the crime scene, of the remote person providing additional information, which normally would just be on the phone, if at all, or on, the, on the radio, and whether augmenting the crime scene would increase distributed situational awareness and team situational awareness among, let's say, the police arriving at the crime scene, the fire department arriving at the crime scene afterwards, or the, yeah, the, the ambulance, let's say, and the forensic investigators at the end. So we developed a system that allowed um, to augment the crime scene and to connect to a remote person. And um, let's see, next slide would be a movie again. A, and it is a movie. Let's see. I think it works. It's a better. movie. Okay. Thank you. Starting the movie. Um, what you see here is we basically what we did at the Netherlands Forensic Institute. They had a 
so-called CSI lab, we staged an ecstasy lab um, in an apartment with a lot of props. And then we played a scenario in which the police gets a call about some specific smell and they are asked to investigate this. So they arrive at the crime scene at some point of time. Um, and then they enter the building, they take the person living there into custody, call in the fire department to check on the chemicals. The fire department calls the forensics to check on, on, check on the evidence and collect evidence as well. And what we did, we ran the scenario once with the technology they were using at that point of time mainly to do this, which is their mobile phone, taking pictures and during handover to the other organization, they showed the pictures on the phone or sent the pictures along. And then we did this more, let's say, human augmentation style. Um, at that point of time was a Meta headset, Meta One, which for which the policeman had to carry a backpack still. Um, but via this whole setup, a remote person could also see what's happening and the policeman at the moment gets some information about the person living there. And I try to skim a bit forward because what happens, they enter the crime scene, as you can see here, they walk around, and then you can see here that the remote person can see that as well. Um, interestingly enough, you can see the field of view. So this is basically the gray field in the middle is what the field of augmentation the local person has, whereas the whole picture is what the camera captures. And um, But still, basically via this interface, they could work together in augmenting the crime scene and sharing information between organizations. So at the end of each run, basically this whole crime scene was augmented with, well, arrows, signs for chemicals, how dangerous certain chemicals are. And also after the forensics have been there with some information on how to collect evidence in there. So let's see. And if all is well, I now move to the next slide. Is that correct? It's correct. It seems to work better. So just okay. assume it's working Good. now. Thank you. Um, so the most important aspect in here was to assess situational awareness. Um, situational awareness, there are several techniques to rate or judge situational awareness, like self-rating techniques, which rely on subjective assessments of the person in there. Freeze probe techniques, where you basically hold the person in the execution of a task and ask about how well this person understands the situation. Uh, Real-time probe techniques um, where you have experts asking queries online and um, observer rating techniques. But in the end, within this project, because we didn't want to interrupt the play or the investigation of the crime scene, we settled with a self-rating technique. And the one that is used most often in this case is um, SART, Situation Awareness Rating Technique which has 10 dimensions, is judged on a seven point Likert scale um, and is very applicable the moment the task is dynamic, collaborative and changeable like it was in our case. And it is administered post-trial. In the end, you basically calculate a SART score, which is on understanding and att attentional demand and attentional supply. And, um, and the formula is like this and the reference is also given below. And uh, just for, for your reference, and I will share the slides later on, um, this is a SART questionnaire. There is um, a glitch somewhere in some publications where only nine dimensions are used, like in here. So I missed to copy one, I will correct that. Yeah, so, yeah, indeed miss one. Um, I'm sorry for that, I will fix that. But um, you have the understanding, which is from information quantity, quality and familiarity of the situation. Um, you look at the attentional demand. Um, so basically what is um, necessary to understand the situation. Here you look at the instability of the situation, the variability and the complexity and the attentional supply. And this is basically where I just before the lecture <laughs> copied the attentional demand to the attentional supply. So basically there are four dimensions on the attentional supply, which are on, if I'm correct, on arousal, spare mental capacity, concentration, and the division of attention. And I will correct it in the slides that I share with Tobias. We also looked at uh, the workload 
And um, for this, we used the task load index. Most of you will probably know as well. Um, what we didn't do at that point of time is to use weights to judge um, the, yeah, the importance of the different um, subscales. But if you would apply the task load index as um, initially intended, you would have the participants run through the scenario first and then judge how important mental demand, physical demand, temporal demand, own performance, effort and frustration are in that situation. Using these assessment techniques, we in the end learned that the team situation awareness using human augmentation is increased. Um, and we could identify design recommendations. So basically establish a shared visual space between the local and the remote really helps to increase awareness between the two people because they have visual information that they share. Using AR to enrich the crime scene with information really helps to pass on information between the different organizations. Um, basically, every local person said like the remote colleague at his visor is really helpful in stressful situations because this person can support you in taking decisions. Um, having this connection between the local and the remote increased the presence of the remote expert at the local scene, which is really nice. But on the other end, there's still issues around trust and understanding because this person is just, let's say, in our case, was just a voice and not represented as an avatar and they couldn't interact with this person. Um, what we would like to do and still what I'm thinking about is how to transfer this, what we have learned to other scenarios and how to use different modalities of increasing presence and step allowing for um, interaction, communication and collaboration. Um, this is so far on safety and security. And as a final part, that's basically what I more recently started about, let's say, two, three years ago, is on superhuman sports. Um, and here I would, I'm using human augmentation to give humans new capabilities and create new sports. But I would like this movie to speak for itself for a second, because that's of the superhuman sports society. So at some point of time, I got into contact with the Superhuman Sports Society and um, they had the goal and that this is why the movie started with 2020 um, during the Summer Olympics, which have not taken place this year, but they wanted to do um, Superhuman Sports Olympics as well, where they basically wanted to showcase um, sports relying on technology that give humans new capabilities and allow for new experiences and um, seeing how far these sports engage people into physical activity. And this is also my major interest in to superhuman sports is to see how well technology can be really used um, to encourage and foster physical activity. Um, the approach that um, basically together with um, uh, Masahiko Inami, Yonota Kimoto, um, Kota Mina Misawa, Kai Kunze, and then myself, that we basically laid out in, in an article that we wrote and that is that you can think about augmenting human uh, capabilities in three different ways. You can think about augmenting senses, you can think about augmenting the body, and you can think about augmenting the playing field. My recent work was mainly on augmenting the playing field, but still I would like to briefly explain what the others might be. So augmenting the senses, um, and if you think about superhuman sports, could be providing humans with new, a new sense, like a spider sense to detect if someone is in danger of your team, for example, or an x-ray vision, or the possibility to look into the future, however you would do that, and then map the play world onto existing senses. So um, 
doing this would basically allow to um, how do you say yeah provide new experience in the superhuman sport. For example, on the right side you see uh, one um, yeah one part of the equipment a Japanese team used to augment dodgeball, and with these gloves basically you could um, you got feedback on whether you were hit or what your current standing in the uh, in the game was. This is an example uh, the team from Kaikunsu developed, and that was on about dubhead, a sensory substitution. That was a sport that basically, the moment you closed your eyes, you got um, heat sensations in the hands, and th with these heat sensations, like feelings where something is hot and where something is cold, you could basically, while your eyes were closed, select or collect playing equipment, and then open your eyes again and you use this within the game. This is another one that the, another Japanese team did was about um, using these drones to give um, the players the idea of yeah, basically jumping really far ahead. So just by slightly pulling them up, they got the impression that their jump was super long or the league, super leak. Um, another possibility was on augmenting the body. Um, so the idea here is to provide equipment as a natural extension of the body um, and integrate this with the body. So these kind of body extensions could then be used um, for superhuman sports. So on the right side, you can see me and Kai Kunze wearing one, um, yeah, um, yeah, some kind of vest that were basically using PGM induced force feedback or providing PGM force induced force feedback. It was mainly something like laser tagging, um, but the moment you were hit, basically the vest was contracting and was limiting your movements. So you could basically feel how, yeah, you, you basically the vest constrained your capabilities and made it more difficult for you to participate in the laser tagging game. Within other examples are, for example, the meta arms. I don't know whether some people of you know about it, but in here you basically uh, get two additional arms and you can control the arms with your feet. And the idea was that you could use these meta arms to get new capabilities, like carrying more weight or while you were basically walking and carrying a large weight, using the meta arms to open a door. And you could also use it to create new sports with it in which you basically would play with four arms. Or, for example, the prosthetic tail that gives you um, a, a different perception of balance while you're playing a game would have been possible, also possibilities. Um, I, as I said, basically looked into augmenting the playing field. And um, I looked also very much into redesigning existing sports by adding virtual elements but using mainly augmented reality to create the impossible by challenging physics or making things possible that you normally could not do. Augmenting the playing field also allows you, and that is the picture on the right side, allows you to train in a safe environment. And that's a group uh, on Chris Geiger in Düsseldorf in Germany, and they built um, a climbing wall. And they could basically climb on that wall and at, at, certain, at the current stage they are using even a revolving treadmill for climbing and you are basically climbing up this wall and had the impression that you are somewhere in the mountains and they use it for preparing climbers to, um, that had these issues with a fear of height for example. In a safe environment you can be exposed to this and train this and basically allows you to train new skills and uh, enhance your capabilities in climbing. Examples that we I worked on in Delft is, um, for example, play your run. Um, I did that together with a student, Mathieu van Zon, and uh, she liked running, but she didn't like running alone. And uh, she also did not like running with others that were not basically um, that were better than her or not at, well that were not at her level. Let's put it like this, and um, that's why she came up with play your run. And it's, in the end, it's a combination of um, going for a run, but being teamed up with somebody, somebody else 
who is not local. And that's a design study, I need to say. So we we didn't build, did not build the system, but we explored the different mechanics in the system within a gym hall and to see whether that is really engaging. So the idea here is that you go out, you go for a run, and then you're paired with someone who also goes for a run. And then you compete against each other. But you compete on, a, let's say, virtual distance. So you start at different locations, and then you start running. And at some point of time, you will find some power-ups, like you, for example, also know from Mario Kart, if you play that. And then you can use these power-ups to make it more difficult for your opponent or to slow down your opponent or to challenge your opponent to do certain things. Skimming a, skipping a bit forward. So in the end, there were some... Um, you arrive at the, at the finish. And in this case, um, Gobert loses the run. And um, so what we could see, well, not using this system, but uh, using a setup in a sports hall where we had some balloons that had to be touched, that we could see that alone the gamification of the run um, helped um, the participants in the, in the study to, well, um, to be more engaged than they would normally be with running. Another ex example, and that should be this one, was a game that we developed, League of Lasers. And in the League of Lasers game, we basically used um, the idea of Pong. Um, sorry for that. But uh, moved Pong to a 3D world. So you players, two players or more players in a team were using HoloLens and the HoloLens basically acted as a mirror. And uh, during play, there was a laser beam and you had to use um, the HoloLens or the mirror that was visualized in front of the HoloLens to reflect this laser beam and make sure that this laser beam hits the goal of your opponent. And uh, the screen part that you're seeing here, that was during play was always visualized on a large screen so that the people in the audience could actually see what's happening because just watching these two players running back and forth on the HoloLens, at least for sports, is not very interesting for the audience. It's rather hilarious to watch over time. But showing and visualizing this top-down view of the playing field really helped also the audience to understand on what is going on. And um, we showcased this game during a super young sports exhibition in Delft. And uh, it was interesting to see how engaging this game was to basically the audience that could test it. People were really putting or donning the whole lens and started to run around and chase the laser beams. And I was sometimes really scared that I afterwards would not have HoloLenses anymore. And as a final example, this is something that we just recently saw here at um, the Hit Lab, um, not using the HoloLens, but the Magic Leap. Uh, we called it Wizards for now, but it's basically like the dueling in Harry Potter. So you fight against each other, casting spells, raising a shield, collecting some mana so that you can um, basically, yeah, fight longer. So. Okay, um, what we mainly did in evaluating these games so far, because we did not run really large studies, we looked at the experience of the users. We didn't use the game experience questionnaire, but this, in this case, the user experience questionnaire, um, which also measures the experience 
of players or users with interactive products. Um, it's um, yeah, it looks at six aspects like attractiveness, perspicuity, efficiency, dependability, and stimulation, and does it by placing basically two antonyms for attractiveness, for example, annoying and enjoyable um, at the ends of a seven step scale. And then afterwards you can basically calculate uh, quantitative numbers on the user experience and compare this to other products. Um, what we have learned from the superhuman sports um, that augmenting senses the body or the playing field, in our case, a playing field, really encourages physical activity. It allows for new sports experiences and is very often conceived as engaging. Saying that we haven't run large studies, um, longer term evaluations of engagement and other human factors are necessary. So our perception at the moment here is mainly on observations and qualitative statements and interviews with the participants playing the different human, superhuman sports in our experiments. What we also learned is that um, it might be due to the technological limitations as well, but the simpler you keep the game idea, um, the more engaging the game is perceived. So the moment you think about very difficult mechanics, different ha difficult hand gestures, difficult things that need to be done in order to advance in the gameplay, um, the, the, the engagement is rather low and players do not get really into the flow. The best example that we had really was this League of Lasers game that really triggered people and made them like run around like crazy. What is also very important, you need to think with superhuman sports and specifically the moment you use augmentation, you need to think about the audience. Um, the audience need to know and need to needs to understand what's going on. And possibly you can also think about ways to let the audience participate and support teams on the field. Because the moment you start digitizing the game or the play, um, the audience can have a play in that as well. So they can, could, for example, provide power-ups for the team they like most. Okay, um, to conclude, um, within health, um, we learned that games are suitable for motor assessment um, and that the human augmentation needs to be adaptive and meaningful for the tasks that you would like to measure. Uh, within safety and security, we learned that human augmentation improves situation awareness. <clears throat> What I've not talked about increases the task load because it introduces a new technology to, to the scene, to the workplace, and it also changes work processes. So the moment you have a remote person constantly attending and following a local person, it changes the existing work processes as well. Within sports, um, we learned that human augmentation, so far we could see that by now, encourages physical activity. And what I would like to un understand better is what really needs to be done to keep this physical activity up and have a longer term engagement with this physical activity. So what I think needs to be done on human augmentation in the future to really make it engaging, there's a lot on, let's say, the more technological side. So there's definitely a need for better displays, higher resolution, higher field of view. The equipment needs to become more ergonomic. Um, also, um, Real-time space capturing and tracking still needs improvement, though well, the whole lens magic leap really do fabulous things. Um, still, I think there is room for improvement, specifically the moment you want to go outdoors or be very active and very dynamic. Thinking about superhuman sports, things need to get become better. And the thing that I put in the box is where my interest lies a lot. So I would like to look in the future more into more multimodal interaction. So how can different forms of interaction be integrated into human augmentation? Um, I would like to think about how the virtual content actually can also interact uh, with the real world. This is why there is a holodeck screenshot in the right lower corner of the slide. And ultimately, I, I would like to think about design guidelines and a model for engagement that really allows me to assess engagement over a longer period of time and clearly point out what needs to be done within the design field of human augmentation to keep people and users engaged. And I think that's my last slide. So I would stop sharing now and I would be very happy to get some questions. Sorry for all these 
technological issues in between. First of all,